plastic deformation or a green stick type of a fracture, complete fracture, comminuted fracture, and we'll come to it later in the course of the lecture. Also, you look at the amount of displacement, what is the stability of reduction, and also time since injury. Very, very important in our country where we see a lot of patients, a lot of children coming to us quite late after some manipulations or some local uh, Ayurvedic treatment, and then the decision may differ. So all these factors need to be taken into account when you decide what will be your treatment. So coming to plastic deformation, which is a special type of a fracture seen only in children. So as all of you know, this, when you look at the x-ray, you can't see any particular fracture line. The, the fracture, the bones just look bent, but there are multiple micro fractures along the length. And that is what is called as plastic deformation. So may I ask uh, Dr. Gaurav, do you, if you see such patients, you think uh, that this is going to remodel and you just treat them with plaster in situ or you do something, any, any idea? What is the age of the child? Age of the child is four years. Yes, ma'am, we just plaster in situ because they remodel. Okay. Anyone else has any other opinion? So as I rightly I mentioned earlier that you take into account a lot of things, not just the age of the child, but a lot of other things. So when in plastic deformation, you require to do actual reduction and then give cast when the child is more than six years, if the angulation of the fracture is more than 20 degrees, when you look at the clinical aspect and the child coming to you with the fracture, if there is a clinically evident deformity, it's going to heal with the same deformity. So that is also an important factor to be taken into consideration and the limitation of pronation supination. So these factors, if these are present, then you need to reduce them and then give cast and not just give cast in C2. And mind you, it just looks like a bent uh, bone, but the reduction is very difficult and you have to give a very sustained and controlled tra counter traction traction. So always do this under anesthesia. Don't try and do it just as an OPD procedure because it's quite painful and you may not achieve the desired reduction. So always do it under anesthesia. And this is a technique which is described by Sanders and Heckman, where you give a counter at the convex apex of the deformity and counter traction proximal and distal and give a very gentle, sustained, prolonged traction and counter traction. And then you achieve reduction and then give cast. So remember that when you see plastic deformation, it's not that it is just a bent bone and everything will remodel. And there are certain indications where you need to actually reduce them. So ma'am, one question. Like the, at times there are children less than six years with a gross uh, deformity. Mm -hmm. So uh, should we correct if the deformity, yes. even in the younger children, because they yes. might progress within plus? Yeah. So as I said, if the deformity is gross, as you said, say 30, 40 degrees, there is an there is a limitation to the amount of remodeling which you get so they may become better but they may not completely remodel so then why not you know do it right at the time you know and then just wait because the parents will become apprehensive the child will have that cosmetic bent bone and you know all the relatives everything keep telling them that the bone is bent so these are the indications if it's a gross even if in a younger child i would do a, re a reduction and then give cast makes it much more simpler than be apprehensive and, you know, go for a later corrective osteotomy if required. But if it's a very, you know, subtle sort of a deformity, then they do remodel. So these are the evidence base. It says that if it is gross, then you do, do, do it even in a younger child. Now coming to green stick fractures. So this is again a special variety of fractures seen only in children. So as all of us know that it's an incomplete fracture, like a stick which gets bent and, you know, breaks only at one End. So it involves only one cortex, but the opposite cortex is still intact. So here, many of the times, especially when the fractures are at different level, it is you, should, you must understand what is the mechanism of injury. It's a rotational force which leads to this type of green stick fracture. And always look at, look at the apex of the angulation. If it is a volar angulation, that's a supination force which leads to this type of a fracture. As against, if you have a pronation injury, that leads to a dorsally angulated green stick fracture. And why is it important? Any one of you want to, uh, you know, aware of this? Dr. Sheenam, Dr. Meet. Uh, Ma'am, the reduction would be uh, 
in the exact opposite way if it's a supination injury then the then a pronation would be the uh, way yes. to reduce it correct so it's not always that you know for any fracture you require like an adult traction counter traction then angulation it is always you look at the mechanism this just applies not only to forearm but any bones in pediatric ankle fractures where you have all those supination inversion other injuries you have to reverse the mechanism of injury so here just by simply de rotating you can get get a very good reduction and you did not go for those significant traction counter traction so always understand the fracture what is the mechanism which makes your reduction technique very easy so ivan has recommended that if it's a apex dorsal angulation then you do supination and if it is apex volar then you do pronation which is just the opposite of the mechanism which has caused the fracture and easy to remember is to rotate the palm towards the angulation so if it is a volar angulation then you rotate you pronate it and then if it is a apex dorsal you supinate so rotate the palm towards the deformity if it if it that makes it easier to remember another important thing is one you have once you have de rotated you have to confirm radiologically whether you have achieved the right amount of de rotation and you have achieved a, an acceptable reduction or no so for this i would recommend that all of you go through this paper which is a very nicely written article which is described uh, what is known as a radius crossover sign for mal reduced green stick fracture so this by if you understand this you can assess and you know uh, read the post or post reduction extent decide whether you have achieved a good amount of uh, reduction or no so for this we need to know what is the normal alignment of these radius and ulna bones in 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 our forearm so if you have a look at your supinated forearm if this forearm if you see x ray wise then there is no crossing over of radius over the ulna both bones are separate you have the radial bow you have the ulna and there is no crossing over if the forearm is in neutral then the radius crosses over in the distal half as against if the forearm is in pronation then the crossing over occurs quite proximally so you must remember this in your mind and then if you look at any of the post reduction x ray suppose this is the x ray the the child the resident reduced the fracture and then asked the consultant whether he has achieved a good reduction or no so now to analyze this you break up this x ray into two half the proximal half you see that the radius is already crossed over so as we had seen earlier when it is already crossed over it's supposed to be in pronation but now look at the distal half of the x ray and you compare with the normal one here it is not it is look looks like it has crossed over in the distal half so that part of the forearm is in neutral rotation and that means the proximal half is in pronation the distal half is in neutral so there is a mal rotation it is not reduced well and there is you need to re reduce this otherwise the child will have a rotational deformity when the plaster comes out and the fracture unites so this is a very important sign and you must analyze your post reduction x ray in order to know under cm only where you can rectify and correct it Com coming to complete fractures again here there are a lot of other factors which you need to take into account for deciding your management like what is the age of the child so in in effect how much time the child has for remodeling which are the bones involved is it just radius or both radius and ulna what is the level of the fracture because all of us know that closer to the growth plate more chance of remodeling so the amount of acceptability is different at different levels of fracture and of course then you assess these other components of the fracture geometry itself like displacement angulation shortening etc so again to analyze the post reduction x ray is very important so once you reduce now here it's a complete fracture so you have to again do it under anesthesia never do it as an opd procedure because quite painful and you may not get the adequate muscle relaxation which is required to give adequate traction and get length so under anesthesia first exaggerate the deformity which will relax the periosteum on the concave side which will allow you to give traction and then tense the soft tissues so then give traction and then again reduce the fracture by opposing the uh, direction of force so then then you see what your cm x ray shoot looks like and whether the reduction which you have achieved is acceptable or no so these are the uh, well known uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, proved criteria described by price et al where they say that less than 8 years and more than 8 years what is the acceptable limits for a forearm fracture 
And within this limit, if you get the reduction, then it is likely to do well eventually when the child is skeletally mature. So uh, as expected, less than eight years, you can accept little more amount of angulation, malrotation. The displacement is always acceptable. Loss of radial bow, yes, acceptable in less than eight years. But if it is the child is more than eight years, then you, you, you can accept less amount of angulation, malrotation, etc. So again, this is there, this table is there, but you have to apply it when you see the post-reduction X-ray. So which becomes at times difficult. So I always tell my residents to remember this mnemonic and then systematically analyze the post-reduction X-ray. So remember this mnemonic broad, which says B for bow of radius, R for rotation, O for overlap, A for angulation, and D for displacement. So when you see a post-reduction X-ray, you have to analyze all these factors and then decide whether I'm going to accept this or do I give a second attempt of reduction and then improve my reduction so that I have a good outcome. So let's see each of them individually. So bow of radius needs to be maintained, at least in case of older children. Otherwise, they will have compromised intraosseous space and limitation of pronation supination. So you must remember that the maximum radial bow is at 60% of the radial length. And it is about the amount is about 15 degrees, about 10% of radial length is the amount of normal bow. So you, when you see the X-ray, you see whether that has been restored or no. Coming to rotation, as we had seen for uh, that crossover sign that you can look at. Uh, and here you have another thing which you can assess and see radiologically because rotation is always very difficult to judge because you know it's the that plane which is not seen when you take biplanar x-rays AP and lateral. So Rangi said that you must remember that the bicipital tuberosity and the radial styloid are exactly at 180 degrees to each other if you have a proper AP x-ray. And same way on the lateral view, the, your olecranon uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the coronoid process and the ulnar styloid are again at exactly 180 degrees to each other. So when you see the X-ray, you see whether these alignments are maintained or no, that will give you an idea about the rotational maneuver. And also you can see at as the mismatch between the cortices. So that gives you an idea whether the rotational alignment is restored or no. Overlap, almost about one centimeter, less than one centimeter of overlap or shortening is acceptable in each of the bones, provided your other, other parameters are within normal limits. So overlap is okay. You may not get 100% end-to-end, -end, but little overlap is acceptable. In fact, that relaxes the interosseous membrane when you have little shortening and that may lead to little more uh, rotations. Coming to angulation, depending upon the level of the fracture, the amount of angulation acceptable varies. So in lower third, about 20 degrees of angulation, in middle third, 15 degrees, and in upper third, about 10 degrees of angulation is acceptable, remodels well, provided you have about two years of growth remaining. Finally, coming to displacement. So displacement, almost complete translation, 100% translation in the upper middle third are known to reliably remodel. Also bayonet reduction is acceptable. But remember, they are very difficult to maintain. So you have to be very vigilant, take proper x-rays, need to have a good cast to maintain that bayonet reduction because almost 30% of them are known to have re-displacement and there are malunion chances. So when you are accepting these, you be very, 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 very critical in your vigilant and critical in your follow-up so as to pick up early re-displacement or try and revise it. So as we saw that the angulation rotations are the most important things. The other ones have little play in uh, you know accept acceptance level. So once you've achieved a good reduction, your step one is over, but that doesn't assure that you are going to get a good outcome. Equally important is a good casting technique because ultimately you need to maintain this reduction till the fracture unites. So casting is equally important. And unfortunately, the art of casting is now forgotten because most of them end up with the operative techniques. So you must practice well. You must know the principles well to give a good cast. You must attain a good casting index less than 0.7, which means you all know, I think, casting index is the ratio of inner diameter of the cast on the lateral view at the fracture site and divided by the inner diameter of the cast on AP view uh, at the fracture site. When you give a cast, you, you must remember that the elbow should be at 90 degrees. Your ulnar border should be straight because there are chances of sagging, ulnar sagging, the banana cast. If you've not given it well, you've not remodeled and 
molded it well on that area, the ulna may angulate and which will lead to a very bad cosmetic deformity. Also, you must have a correct three-point and introscious molding. You must protect all the bony prominences so that you don't develop any complications of cast. So again, to uh, have objective assessment, there are these various cast indices which are described. I would not go into the details because some of them are a little complex. You can go through the books, but it's always good to analyze your cast also. What is especially the cast index? The padding index, because sometimes you give a lot of padding, ultimately, which leads to you know less control and loosening and loss of reduction. So you don't want to lose your reduction, which you have achieved with so much care and analyzed it so well. So all these indices, it is always better to analyze your post-reduction uh, uh, X-ray and then assess whether you have achieved these indices within the acceptable range. So these are good and, you know, cast padding index, Canterbury gap index, all these indices, you can go through your books and then try practicing when you see your post-reduction x-rays and post-follow-up x-rays. Also this, once you've achieved good reduction, step one over, good cast, step two over, equally important is the last step, which is your follow-up. Because if you do a good job and then forget about it, then you are going to lose it. We all know that there are very high chances of redisplacement within the cast because of reduction of swelling or sometimes the patient not maintaining the cast well and so on and so forth. So post-reduction protocol is also equally important. You must give a good limb elevation so that there's no swelling, no compartment, which are common complications. And a weekly follow-up is required for at least first two to three weeks because we know that loss of reduction in seed in as high as 20 to 40% and almost five to 15% land up uh, going for remanipulation. So as you can see here, the reduction, which was at one week, there was some loss and more angulation in, on, on, on the second week cast. So you, if you are vigilant, you can pick them up early and rectify it. And otherwise, if everything is going well, you remove the cast and again, take the X-ray at four to six weeks, depending on the age of the patient. What happens if you see, suppose, uh, you know, like this X-ray now, this two weeks X-ray showing more angulation. Any opinion from any of the uh, uh, delegates? What will you do if you see this at two weeks? Dr. Gaurav? We, we might have to re-manipulate. So you will remove the cast and re-manipulate or you will try to rectify something? Or uh, you will straight away go for open reduction or like, sorry, uh, any fixation and anything like that? I would like to re-manipulate and lower this thing. Okay. So that's one way of looking at it. But there are certain uh, minor maneuvers, you know, sometimes you can do something called as cast wedging. So does it work? And which are the ones where you can just, because it's a small OPD procedure, you know, you don't require any anesthesia, simple procedure, non-invasive. So this paper uh, from JPO 2014 has studied such patients and they found that if there is isolated one plane angulation, like just isolated varus valgus or apex bowler deformity, then you can achieve, you can try cast wedging and up to five degrees of angular correction is possible. And you always do, if at all you are planning this, you always do an open wedge, never do a close wedge. And then again, serially follow up. So there is this is some you know middle path sort of thing which is very uh, less invasive and which can give you a good result if you have a subtle amount of angulation uh, loss and it's in one plane. So this again should be uh, given a choice whether that is a possible option. So now this is about the conservative. Now coming to surgical treatment. So which are the uh, uh, fractures which do not do well with just conservative? So certain in indications for surgical, like an open fracture or a very old adolescent child where again, maintenance will be difficult and achieving the reduction may be difficult. Irreducible fracture due to some soft tissue interposition or a major loss of reduction. The patient has presented late and already started uniting or a malunion where you, know, you will not be able to get close. So these are certain indications for surgical treatment. So we have the option, and I think all of you might have seen or done this elastic stable intramedullary nailing. I will not go into the technical details, but just some tips and tricks to get a good outcome after nailing. So when you are doing both the bones nailing, sometimes it is, uh, you know, it is easier. The one which is easier to do can be rotted first, 
the nail entry point has to be very, very specific. You must avoid physis, be away at least a centimeter or centimeter and a half away from the physis because you don't want to lead into any iatrogenic complications because of your operative procedure. You must protect the superficial radial nerve where when you are taking the lateral entry for the retrograde radial nailing, or if you are taking a dorsal entry near the listus tubercle, you know that it is very close to the extensor pollicis longus tendon. And if you are not careful, you may land up with uh, irritation, rupture of the tendon or problems with that. So even while cutting the nail, you have to be very careful that you are not going to be in a such a way that will irritate the tendon later and lead to problems. So avoid your physis. Be careful about the neurovascular structures around the point of entry. Also, you must not try and repeatedly do a lot of repeat maneuvers, you know, if you're not getting the reduction. So maximum three attempts of doing close reduction. If you're not getting it, have a very low threshold of doing a mini open. You can just make a small opening and then reduce the fracture under vision and then pass the nail across the fracture. Because if you, it's been said in literature that if you give repeated attempts, then there are very high chances of developing compartment syndrome up to an extent of almost 54%, which is very, very high. So have a low threshold for mini open and you can achieve a, a good uh, reduction and then pass the nail across. Each procedure in orthopedics, you know, has its own gamut of complications. Some of them are iatrogenic, some of majority in fact are due to faulty technique or you know not taking care of the surrounding soft tissue and other technical details so these are some of the infection uh, complications like you can develop with wound infections you can have osteomyelitis you may perforate the soft tissue or this develop bursitis injury to the surrounding structures even after because the nail is not uh, completely stable you may have to supplement them with cast if you've not done that there could be again loss of reduction you may have pseudoarthrosis and delayed union, and this is seen especially when you do an open thing. So always try and get a close because chances of delayed union become more if you have opened the fracture. But again, you have to be judicious because you don't want to keep on doing it because you are uh, dreading the complication of uh, delayed union because you may end up with compartments. You have to justify and do it very rationally. And the refracture rate is also high. So these are some of the complications. So when you go for plate fixation, like in adults, all the forearm fractures are plated, nail is hardly done, but in children, it's the other way around. It's only when the child is very close to skeletal maturity in adolescence, if there is a lot of comminution and you may not get a good reduction or the nail passage may, may be difficult. If the child presents late where already, you know, you have some amount of callus or periosteal reaction there, and the nail negotiation may be difficult. There is significant angulation. That is the way anyway you need to open it, then might as well plate it and get a stable reduction because then early mobilization can be started. The choice of implant can be either a 2.7 or 3.5 DCP, or you can use one third tubular plate in very small children. And you four cortices are sufficient on either side of the fracture, unlike in adults where you have to have five or six cortices. So when do you use nail plate? which is better. This is a systematic review done in uh, published in injury 2014. And they've done the review of functional outcomes and complications of intramedullary nail versus plate for both bone diaphyseal fractures. And they've studied eight uh, retrospective non-randomized comparative studies are reviewed. And at the end of it, their conclusion is that there's no statistically significant dis difference in the functional outcome or time to union, but always nailing is safer and it is equally effective. So always try for nailing because it is minimally invasive and you avoid a lot of other complications of plate. But again, you have to justify and have your indications clear. So if I have to summarize just the technical and the practical aspects of forearm fractures, I would say that close reduction still remains the gold standard, but you have to be uh, very uh, you know, careful and do it well. Also have a good cast technique so that the reduction which you have achieved gets maintained. For plastic deformation, remember that they may require reduction under anesthesia. It's not that all bent bones will remodel. Green stick fractures, as we discussed, we need to remember that it is the rotational uh, mechanism. So it is important to de-rotate during reduction. And complete in complete fractures, you have to pay attention to the criteria of accept acceptability and analyze your post-reduction X-ray well so that you, you know whether you have an acceptable reduction or no. 
Again, frequent follow-up and maintenance of reduction by a good casting technique is equally important as doing the reduction and analyzing it. And reserve your plates and nails for fractures in adolescents or older children or the indications that we discussed earlier. So thank you very much. And I, I hope that I have uh, you know, added some more uh, knowledge to what you all already know. And I hope that this will be of practical use when you deal with such fractures. Thank you. This, this was a very nice talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, Gaurav, you can have questions now. Thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful talk. It has given a lot of clarity to us. So, I have a few questions. Uh, one Be a little louder. You are not audible yeah. well. Am I, am I audible now? Yeah, better. So, uh, my question is, does rotation also remodel with time? So, rotation uh, remodeling is not, not uh, actually remodeled. It is more of angulation, but sometimes the rotation is the third dimension. If you have angulation in uh, sagittal plane and in coronal plane, eventually it's a three-dimensional one, a bit of a rotational one. So the angulation does, does remodel, but the rotation does not. But at the same time, when you have a rotational deformity in upper limb, sometimes it gets does get compensated by a little bit of your shoulder rotation. So the functionally, the child may not have that much of uh, disability. And that is why in your criteria, they have said that up to 30 degrees or 45 degrees of mal rotation can still be accepted, but you may not have a hundred percent, but uh, the, the remodeling is not there for the rotation. Okay. So acceptability as, the, as it will be compensated by the shoulder. Yes. Another question is, if we have a case where both the bones are displaced and we are we are deciding to operate, and when we reduce and fix one bone, the other bone is well aligned. So okay. in that case, is it necessary to fix the another bone also, or we can just fix one bone and give a cast or slap? Yeah, so it is very well accepted. And there are multiple papers, if you go through literature, of one bone nailing. So it is fairly okay if you do one bone nailing, but again, because the other bone is now treated conservatively, you have to be vigilant and, you know, it has to be again within the acceptable range. So it should not be that that is, you know, very grossly unacceptably reduced and still you. So one bone nailing is well accepted and it has shown to have good results. So you can very well do it, one bone nail. So there's a paper from Dr. Atul Bhaskar on this. Uh, so if uh, someone wants to read through, yeah. that paper is uh, some good references so that can give clue. There are multiple papers actually on this one bone nailing. Other thing is uh, the madam said that when there is a green stick fracture, you turn the uh, forearm towards the angulation. One mnemonic which Taral has uh, shared and I'm using that. It's a very special person and, and the DPS, DPS is a well-known school. So when the angulation is dorsal, it's a pronation injury and you apply plaster and supination. And very special person is when there is apex bowler, it's a supination injury and you apply plaster in pronation. So VSP and, D, and DPS, that's what uh, mnemonic you can remember. And that's how I I always remember. So that can be of some use. Yeah. yeah. So or else, as I said, remember you rotate the palm towards the apex. So if it is volar, you rotate volarly. So you're pronating. And uh, if it is dorsal, then you supin it. Again, I would ask uh, Molin. Let's have discussion for the for their benefit. That what is the position of immobilization? That is always a question by residents. You know the classic tech. Classic teaching is proximal because you have supinator, you supinate, middle you yeah. have, you know, neutral and distally you have the pronator, so you pronate. So what has been your case of position of immobilization? So for all green stick, I, I follow where the apex of deformity is. So if it is a, say apex is on the volar side, then it's it's a supination injury that I would apply in pronation. So I... The reduction should happen with a three-point pressure and then you immobilize in a position of pronation. And if it is in apex dorsal, uh, then it's a, a What about the complete fractures? So, oh, sorry? 
the complete fractures to the brain stick we know yeah, but yeah, yeah. so i i have been following the same you know uh, even for the complete fractures Mm-hmm. and i i have uh, never found uh, the problem i know the sheetal has been discussing that this principle cannot be applied for uh, complete fractures mm-hmm. uh, but i but i apply past in this position and rotate the image intensifier and make sure that this is an acceptable alignment and would immobilize what is your protocol yeah so uh, yeah the proximal ones always in supination middle ones in neutral but for the lower ones you know many times a complete pronation is you know a little difficult to later on get a good uh, you know movements and all some of them may have some problems so i think it is well acceptable that neutral is okay for distal third so proximal middle third yes same supination neutral but even distal third you may not completely pronate even if it is there in neutral yeah. that is fine so yeah. and i think yeah. that is yeah. now uh, practiced and there are some uh, evidences on that that it is okay if you don't pronate completely for the distal ones because sometimes to get the full range is difficult especially in older children you know if they are completely pronated yeah. Yeah. also there are some things about this extension casting extension elbow casts so do you practice them or yeah so if the ulna is pretty proximal and then uh, you try and flex then it, the triceps will pull it uh, so in those cases i don't do it uh, all 90 degrees but maybe 60 or uh, 50 degrees of uh, elbow flexion so it's not not in complete extension but less flexion so that you neutralize triceps force to some extent same so that has been the practice if it's a proximal third the triceps will lead to a dorsal angulation of the ulna and chances of you know developing malunion so it's always better to do about 45 degrees of extension and include your thumb in the cast otherwise there are chances of cast slipping out so if you are giving cast in little extension especially in the small children where you know they are just a very small amount of forearm if you are giving cast in little extension then include your thumb so that will be that will be yeah. uh, preventing malunion and avoid cast slipping another question which uh, fellows frequently ask when there are both bone forearm fractures and you plan to nail them due to various reasons which bone you will nail first yeah so, so it's uh, like everybody's thought one school of thought is that uh, do one which is easier to do it so that you know you have the reduction for the other one becomes simpler one school of thought says always do the radius uh, nail first because that is the one which you know sometimes becomes difficult so i do it the one which is easier to do so sometimes to end up doing alna also first so that yeah. you know, uh, indirectly the other reduction and covering becomes easier because yeah. you have to give very repeated attempts of a close reduction and how many close reduction attempts and passing nail through you would so, try three three attempts i said in my that's what is standard thing that give three attempts and then go for mini open yeah. but remember so, that opening has its own complications whenever we have seen delayed unions it's always in those ones too. which have you know open so because you are opening you are disturbing the periosteum you are dis- disturbing the surrounding and then they always try and go for delayed unions so you have to yeah. be very judicious in deciding your uh, yeah. you know Technique. and uh, for all the fellow it's not wise to plunge with your nail uh, and you fail because there are reports of compartment syndrome with multiple mm-hmm. uh, plunging through the tip, tip of nail so avoid it yeah gauru shall we go for cases now yeah so during the time we uh, dr varun shares his screen one last question i would like to ask ma'am dr varun you can share your screen Ma'am, uh, as we said that we should be slightly away from the physis while making an entry for our nail, around one centimeter away. I just uh, had a question in my mind. During hemi physis disease, we are very close to the physis, and in those cases, we we are not able to have one centimeter of distance. So, I just wanted to know how close to the physis we can be. So, uh, minimum one. To 1.5 because see here in epiphyseal diseases you are just putting that tape and screw here we have that nail end also out which we are eventually going to remove and always remember that it is not just that 
you know, that entry, but that nail which irritates the periosteum and the surrounding perichondrium also can lead to arrest. You know, sometimes you have that periosteum injury, like type 6 rank described that, you know, arrest of the peripheral area of the physis. So be little away because see, when you're using them mainly in the diaphyseal, if they are very distal anyways, you're going to use some other technique. So you have sufficient area, sufficient bone to cover under nail. So I would always prefer at least 1.5 centimeter away because your nail is beyond the entry point. You have some amount of nail there, which you want to keep to remove the nail later. So if you go very close to the physis, then your nail tip will be very again close, can damage the perichondrium and lead to a peripheral growth arrest. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So I'll be presenting this case of a malunited both bone forearm fracture under guidance of Dr. Tarul, sir. So we had this child, 11-year-old male, uh, right hand dominant, who sustained a uh, right both bone forearm fracture and was treated by close reduction and uh, cast application two years back. We don't have the initial trauma x-rays, but this was the x-rays which was taken two months post-injury. So as uh, explained by the points by ma'am, uh, this we also see the crossover sign here. And this was his range of movement. So he had a supination of 40 degrees, pronation of 60 degrees, and his elbow range was full. So we, this were the, these were the fresh x-rays. And the right hand, uh, the, you see that this is an attempted AP view. So basically both the humerus are showing an AP profile, the distal end of the humerus and the right, uh, we can notice the mal rotation on the right side. And this is the left side. Also no, uh, we can see that there is also an angulation of the ulna. So there are three landmark papers by uh, Charles Price and which ma'am had already quoted. So it uh, defines so, the angulation which can be accepted. In can you go back to your yes. initial x-ray and then let, let's read this initial first x-ray. Go back. Yeah. So two, two things which uh, Dr. Binoti Mem said, are they, again, the ulna has set down. You see here. So this is uh, what can happen uh, when we apply plus 90 degree flexion. Now, even though this is a mid shaft ulna, this, this set. So one thing is you must uh, use a cardboard or an acrylic board so that uh, the ulnar border is straight. And Sheetal has one nice video on world-class uh, forearm yeah. casting. So that video you all should see. And crossover sign we already discussed. So this is mal, mal rotated. Uh, also the bow, if you look at, look over here, the bow is completely reversed, you know, you have compromise of the interosseous space to a very great extent and the bow is not maintained. So always as I analyzed it, regarding all the components you assess, bow, the rotation, the angulation is also more than acceptable limits. The displacement is not much, the overlap is not much, but the other three components of the reduction assessment are altered. Yes, go ahead. Yes. So, and he's a badminton player and now he finds difficulty in actually playing. And that is why he actually presented it to us. So, these were the options, whether should we leave this alone or should we intervene? And if we intervene, how do we plan this and what implants to be used? So, definitely you can't leave alone because it is beyond the acceptable limits and we have said that there's not going to be any rotational uh, remodeling and the demands the functionally is getting affected the restricted range of motions are there so obviously osteotomy needs to be planned at the level of the angulation and uh, how you do it what implants is again your choice but I mean, obviously not a nail because when you're anyway opening doing an osteotomy you want to have a stable fixation with plates but planning can be just by your radiology or um, any 3D. Nowadays, you have all these 3D models and, you know, exact planning. So I know Taral does a lot of them. And another thing, as you rightly mentioned that, you know, earlier days, it was said that, you know, you can have 50, 50 degrees and everything else gets compensated by shoulder. 
nowadays the demands are different i think that era and that those that uh, ideology doesn't apply now because children are involved more in sports they do fine activities another thing is a mobile use a laptop use so they require a good amount of rotation so earlier concept where we you when we studied we had that you know if you have 50 50 that is fine you know because rest of the things can be managed with shoulder rotation but now the demands and the type of activities these children do are much uh, you know advanced and you require a good amount of rotation yes so considering his uh, need and uh, uh, we opted for a 3d ct plan, guided planning and 3d printed jigs were utilized for the osteotomy so the entire planning was done based on the 3d ct and uh, materialized software was used uh, so, uh, and we mirrored the opposite side forearm so as to correct the deformity because this the mal rotation cannot be exactly uh, be calculated we have this uh, the evans criteria which ma'am mentioned about uh saying the bicipital velocity and the radial styloid have to be at 90 degrees but it is quite difficult to actually achieve uh, to see this and to achieve the derotation on the uh, on table so the basically these jigs uh, uh, there were two jigs uh, one jig for the cut and next is the correction jig so basically the kys just remain in place and when we play, uh, place the correction jig it uh, derotates and the final uh, we get this final alignment so this is the final picture wherein we see that uh, the deformity on the left side and the corrected on the right side we also did a trial surgery on the 3d printed models prior to the uh, actual surgery and for the radius we chose to act uh, to do an osteotomy and uh, plate both the radius and ulna so this is an in top image showing the jig in place and uh, these are the cm images so uh, first we chose the radial osteotomy and then the uh, ulnar osteotomy was done and uh, the other thing which uh, which is not being seen in all of this is the soft tissue a uh, contracture which is actually present so a uh, generous release of the intrastitic membrane was also done we uh, uh, with using the periosteum these are the final cm images the ulna plate and this is the final x ray right do you have clean clinical pictures you have uh, how did the uh, yeah. other child sir so uh, so is my screen visible uh, yes, yes yes this is march 21 so okay yeah this is three months post op so this was his supination and pronation he the supination which uh, was limited mm mm-hmm. and pronation is bit limited this is a video i think is uh, network has some issue i think so as he was saying you know that they had to uh, release the intrastitic membrane so i would say that whenever you are doing a mal union surgery don't wait too much you know because beyond 6 months if you operate then you significantly encounter the intrastitic membrane contracture the results of mal union surgery are best when you do it at around 6 to 8 months beyond that the soft tissue contracture also becomes too much so uh, you may not get a very good you may really have to release quite a lot i'm sorry so, everyone uh, there are some issues with my bandwidth i'll no i'm just resharing my screen yeah yeah sometimes you know once you uh, when there is this rotational mal alignment the deformity is mainly in the radius and only partly in ulna uh, and once you correct the radius of osteotomized radius many you can get away with putting a rod through the ulna 
So that can also be a possibility. Anyway, so this, uh, yeah, there's a video. So this is the three months post up. He still had a limitation of around 20 degrees of the pronation, but uh, we achieved complete supination, which he gradually uh, also gained. So this is 15 months post up, and now he's for uh, implant removal. So this is his current range. The, he ha his supination has been completely restored. Terminal 10 degrees of pronation is still restricted, but he doesn't have any limitations as such because pronation can be compensated by the shoulder movements. And elbow range is full and also there's no deformity. So, uh, I have a question. Uh, do you always open the whole thing for putting your jig or any time do you do percutaneous uh, pins through the jig and then just open a small amount of the osteotomy or you always do a full open? Yes, ma'am. Percutaneous, percutaneous can also be done, ma'am. Okay. So in this case, uh, because we had uh, we chose that we will plate and also uh, we were anyway going to open the uh, uh, for the for plating, we chose to uh, actually uh, print the jig as in wherein it sits right on the bone. But with the same software, we can also plan jigs uh, which sits on the soft tissue. Okay. So the advantage of your jig is the exact amount of, you know, the rotation and the calculation with the pre-operative planning, which you can get. Correct. Man. So yeah. in this 51 degrees of uh, derotation was done of the okay. radius and 34 degrees of the derotation of Alna was done, which is very difficult to actually assess on table. Okay. So that helps in good planning of such complex three-dimensional deformities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Perfect. I yeah. will in uh, Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, that was a nice, uh, uh, nice planning and execution. So I had a similar case of uh, I think an adolescent girl present almost like two years after the initial injury. Uh, so I didn't had the I mean, facility to do a 3D assessment and planning. So I went by the basics of X-ray planning. And I could make out based on the alignment of the radius. Uh, the radial tuberosity should be at 180 degrees to the radial stellar. So clinically and radial aspect could make out that it was a rotational malunion of the radius. And uh, as you said, Molin, uh, most of the rotation happens usually in the radius. So I went ahead and did only the radius derotation yeah. osteotomy. And as um, I mentioned, uh, and actually, uh, Warren also mentioned that usually there will be interosseous membrane in contracture. So, I did a radius osteotomy and released the interosseous membrane and did a plating for the radius. That, uh, uh, probably the, because I felt that the malignant was at the middle disc to that junction. So, that's where I did the osteotomy. And yep. she did well. Yeah. Uh, she, so, initially, because of the interosseous membrane in contracture, she couldn't gain adequate movement. I think in subsequent three to four months period, adequate physiotherapy she regained that for a moment. So yeah. So what I do is, you know, once you do the radial osteotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah that's, that's nice. So what you do is uh, that you can rotationally align the radius well. Now. In some instances, mind uh, the less amount of deformity, you can do that. So you can just get away with radius. With a very severe yes. deformity, yeah, may have uh, unless you do ulnar osteotomy, you were not yes. able to do that. Yeah. Yes. So, right. so that uh, decision you can uh, take on uh, on table. Yeah. And another Alnar thing is, okay. another thing is, you know, sometimes we have uh, a tendency that let's get away with just a nail in ulna. I did two cases and. And one yeah. where I nailed Alna, it failed to unite. So I had to go for plating. So okay. in adolescence, always plate um, if you happen to do both the, there's no shortcut, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah let, let, we have short time. Let uh, Meet start uh, presenting your case. So. Dr. Meet is our current fellow. Hello. Just a second. Just a second, sir. Yep.
Yeah. Is the screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I am presenting a case of a twelve-year-old male. He had a history of uh, fall on fall from the outstretched uh, fall on outstretched hand uh, from a after falling from a five feet high wall. So he presented to us four hours after the injury with, uh, with the a gross uh, swelling and pain over the left forearm, and uh, he had a puncture wound over the inner aspect of the left uh, forearm. So we got the X-rays done, and uh, it turned out to be an. Uh, Open grade one mid shaft ulna with uh, proximal third radius and uh, Salter had his type two distal radius of the left side. The right side had a buccal fracture of the distal third radius. So uh, how would we how how do we approach this, ma'am? So, we go back, yeah. So so the left side left X ray that is a grade one open, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, both the, it's a AP and lateral view of the same uh, left forearm. Okay, okay. So again, couple of things for this grade one compound. Again, never take grade ones very lightly because uh, you have to have a thorough debridement because there are there have been reports and cases where grade one lands up with you just ignore as just a puncture wound and then treat them without paying attention to the wound. They land up with infections and osteomyelitis. So first aim would be to give a thorough uh, wash and everything and debride the wound well. And uh, uh, grade one, again, is not always an indication for doing anything major like um, external fixator or something. So you can, after doing a thorough wound debridement, you can do a primary nailing for a grade one. So that can be attempted. So uh, the distal sort of hair is, uh, it, it, it looks not very much uh, disturbed. I mean, uh, quite well aligned, but anyway, when you're going to reduce, you will reduce that uh, fracture and check the stability. And if found a little unstable, you can put a K-wire there. So I would go for a thorough debridement of the wound and then uh, nailing for the ulna and then uh, judge how the radius is falling back, proximal radius also, and then decide about that, whether to nail that or can be left alone with just single bone uh, nailing. Right. So that's that's what we also planned, and uh, then before going in, let's we discuss what is the acceptable forearm fracture reduction at this level. So yeah, Meet, share, go ahead. So we have this paper. Uh, this was published in 1998 by Noonan and Price. Uh, it says that uh, in children less than uh, nine years, uh, the, we have. Uh, a good amount of liberty, we can uh, accept complete displacement, 15 degrees of angulation, 45 degrees of mass rotation. Whereas when it goes beyond nine years, uh, 30 degrees, of, it reduces down to 30 degrees mass rotation, 10 degrees angulation for proximal fractures and 15 degrees for the distal ones. So uh, there was a follow-up study for this, uh, which was done by uh, Zions et al. And this was published in 2005. Here the authors concluded that uh, even in the presence of 100% tibionate apposition, uh, 15 degrees of angulation could still be accepted in the older age group. And uh, they, uh, for uh, close fractures, they would uh, still recommend close reduction with immobilization as the first line of treatment. So the options that we currently uh, have uh, work, uh, it could have been conservative or uh, elastical uh, uh, intermediate nailing or, or plating. So uh, since it was an open grade one fracture, uh, we uh, plan to go for an operative management. So uh, we we went for an elastical st uh, stable uh, in intermediate nailing. And uh, I'm really sorry, we did not have the intra-op images for this. Uh, we have a two-month follow-up. Uh, the two-month follow-up, uh, we did an ALNA nailing and the radius... Uh, the radius so, was we tried to yeah so, uh, <clears throat> yeah so let me tell this story me so what happened i being alna being then open injury uh, we did debri debridement and placed the nail uh, in the alna but after that uh, i tried multiple attempts at putting the nail through the radius but three four times my nail uh, went out of the medullary canal <laughs> And even after a lot of traction and uh, uh, sort of uh, manipulation and close reduction, I could not maneuver the nail in the proximal fragment. 
and I did four attempts. Now this place near in the vicinity of posterior interosseous nerve, I did not want to uh, go for any further close reduction attempt. At that point, I, as we discussed before, there was a hundred percent bayonet, and the angulation was little better than what is seen on this follow-up X-ray. So I thought that let's just do the single bone forearm and uh, accept it. Uh, although I had a lot of uh, stress on my mind with this boy is a national level painter and he uh, was awarded all across India for painting uh, the portrait of Narendra Modi. Uh, but I went on, he was 12 years, again, he was not very young. He's a 12 years old guy. So I followed the literature and uh, explained to the family that besides opening, opening it up, doing to do a lot of uh, quite a proximal plate, if there is some rotational issue, we'll go back and we might derotate the radius. Now at two months, it is looking like this. Uh, there is healing. Ma'am, what do you think and how do you forecast this? He will do it. Uh, the problem is that bayonet and the distal fragment is encroaching the interosseous space. That is one point which is against, you know, the same thing it would have been the other way around, could have been still uh, accepted. But this being encroaching on the interosseous space, I think you'll land up with a lot of rotational problems. And since the yeah. demand is high, then I don't think you can accept this. So you will have to go yeah. down, align it and correct it and do a plating. Yeah, so I, I had the same thought process. And at two months, it has already glued well. So we, uh, with the family, we decided that um, either we, we can do break the bone now or let us wait. And if it remodels to some extent, then we might have to do a, a little lesser uh, uh, osteotomy. And so combined, we make made a decision that we will we'll see how it remodels. And meet the uh, show further what happens. So, so again, uh, this shows that this crossover in uh, the, those papers. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, meet. Yeah. So uh, this is a paper uh, by uh, Texas Scottish, right? Uh, published in two thousand twenty-one. Again, uh, they had uh, similar findings to the previous papers that uh, complete bayonet, ten degrees angulation, proximal, fifteen degrees of distal. All of them, all of that was acceptable. So uh, this is again a paper by the. Uh, by uh, Patrick Wright, which ma'am uh, very well explained, the radius crossover awesome. sign. So uh, I would just uh, skip this as ma'am already explained this well. So this was the follow-up that we had at two months. And now this is the follow-up that we have at uh, nine months. The uh, radius uh, has uh, uh, the radius has remodeled well. And uh, so we uh, did not uh, do any osteotomy for, for now. So we have the range of motion at nine uh, nine months right now. So uh, we can see now uh, he has full range of flexion extension, which is very obvious. He has full range of supination, and uh, and he has just limitation of terminal pronation. And then I asked the family uh, that uh, still there is some. Uh, leg of rotation but there's a huge uh, there's a good range of motion what would you do uh, would you like to go ahead with some surgical intervention to correct it or not go back to the slide of x-ray uh, i i said that uh, i would think if he is my son i would just wait and watch and he, it has remodeled very well and the family said sir we also don't want to go anywhere because he can do everything and he has made a portrait of yours. So sh the meet show that. Yes, Go ahead. So this is just a yeah. short video of uh, the. He he's got full range of motion here. Uh, flexion extension is complete. So. So the final result. Uh, he was satisfied with his range of motion, and he managed to make this. So that proves and that uh, this proves all the scientific. Uh, <laughs> but I would say, Molly, you have a chance when you are going to attempt a nail removal because, uh, you know, at that time you can take a call because you will be subjecting him to anesthesia. And if at all, you know, I mean, this yeah. is. In fact, in, yeah. if, in fact I, I removed the nail 
but uh, parents were very happy and so as uh, this boy what i felt is uh, if you go back to the x-rays meet yes. that this crossover sign is uh, yeah go go one ha huh. so crossover sign can be applied when the radius is completely healed here the crossover is probably not due to rotation but it is due to the translation and angulation so this is a healing bone mm. and then we should wait for some time for this angulation to remodel before we comment that this is a crossover sign if we take it as a crossover then it's a it's it's not it's in not a normal position so two things so, classical radial yeah. crossover sign was described for green stick fracture mal reduced green stick fractures and secondly as i just answered gaurav's first question many times the rotation component is when you have angulation in both the planes the actual in the plane. so it's a very difficult thing so what we may be seeing as rotation may be part of it is because of the angulation which remodels so here also that coronal plane angulation anyway in sagittal plane there was not much angulation it was almost straight only displacement which is very well accepted the coronal plane angulation is one which is remodeled and that has led to some you know feeling of improvement in the rotation so always have a dialogue as you rightly did with the parents and counsel them the only worry many times is that the crooked looking bones and some limitation keeps keeps them very apprehensive they have to be shown with evidence and they have to be counseled that there is a potential for remodeling in angular and other places in children so if they accept that it's a combined decision and of course ultimately the function which which matters the most and the other thing is it's a conventional teaching that as you go away from the growing end of the bone there is less remodeling and so proximal third radius is very notorious bone and but still even in children more than 12 uh, apprehensive and wait and watch and you can always come back and do corrective uh, osteotomy if you want to wait later yeah yeah so thanks me that was a very your your first case you presented but you have presented very nicely thank you very much thank you sir so uh, thank you vinoth imam for that lovely lecture a beautiful talk and gorov uh, and shinam i would like you guys to conclude so i have a question if you see of two minutes yeah yeah this this last result has confused me more because a similar case required a derotation osteotomy later and this case the amount of remodeling which has happened in, in such a short time is is really i mean it is defying what research papers say and what science says so seeing that x-ray everybody i would i think everybody would say that the the proximal fragment is, the distal fragment is encroaching the interosseous membrane and we should do something about it but i mean how to how to take it and how to discuss it with parents because those two cases have absolutely different kind of results i think so gaurav i would say that those two cases are different the one is in the process healing and the other is already healed in mal rotation see so those cases were mal rotated no they may present pretty late to you but if these are in the process of healing like this one you don't take decision on day, day one but you follow them up and see how they are doing how their range of motion are improving and let it heal and remodel completely and if there is residual rotational malalignment then you definitely uh, have to do so these two are not uh, same case they, they are different i mean i mean on day one when when you were when you were nailing it and at that time you were very clearly seeing that the radius is mal positioned but how what was the thought process of leaving it as such I mean, yeah so the two thing two things the one is it was uh, bayonet and the other thing it was not rotated it was uh, it was if you see the ap of elbow and ap of wrist they were both in this uh, plane at 90 degree or 180 degree to each other radial styloid and that so there was no rotation but there was translation and angulation of about 10 degrees 
I was uh, thinking that I will be able to maintain it. Although in the follow-up exercise, there is about five degree of loss of angulation. But at that point, I saw the uh, bridging callus. But still, rotation was fine. That's why I wanted to tell that we should not mistake the angulation and translation as rotational malalignment. So the first case of Varun was a rotational malalignment and the second case has more of angulation uh, deformity. So it's more critical evaluation of x-ray that is, uh, yeah, ma'am, what is your opinion? So practically what I do, as Garo said, maybe we don't have the initial x-rays, but on day one, it would have been well within the acceptable limits. That is why this we had is, was at two months. So if the child comes within the sufficient time, say initial two, three weeks, and you see like this, it is maluniting and you feel that there is a scope for improvement, then I do it at that level because, you know, that time either by just remanipulation or with just, you know, calotesis like you do multiple at that and then break the soft callus, you still can give one attempt. But if they come little beyond that, then it's always safer because anyway, then you will require a complete osteotomy opening and everything. Then I tell, now you wait and watch. Let nature do the remodeling. If at all, then we will do a corrective osteum. So if they come very early within a stage where you can do a minimally invasive and improve it, then yes, you should give them a chance. But beyond certain age, six weeks or so, if they've already started uniting and you united and then you see that, you know, just by a small procedure, it will not work to wait and then do the corrective osteotomy because you are not losing it. The grading and the amount of surgery is going to be the same. So initial follow-up, yeah. fine maluniting can do a remanipulation or break the soft callus and do a minimally invasive and improve. Little beyond that, wait for the nature, then do if required. So I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, spent six weeks of a uh, bit stressed time to avoid that i could have done opened it up bravely and with uh, just a manipulation or with an uh, mini artery forcep kind of joystick kind of reduction uh, probably just a couple of days earlier i had seen a case of distal radius someone had done open and it went on non-union and this my my thought process was about not to open these injuries but then I found this drastic uh, remodeling. So it seems that we we do not give nature uh, time. Yeah. 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 So, right. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. It's 9.15 and uh, thanks for all. We, we enjoyed this session and yeah, we'll record you. and put it for other fellows to listen to it. Thank yeah. You. Thank you for inviting. Nice being a part of this academic feast. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. So I'm, I'm stopping the meeting and I'm leaving, okay? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir.